Hello, how are you all? I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful week. Tonight, I pray that the good Lord will bless us with His bountiful love and His peace that the world cannot offer, and that He will fill our hearts with joy until it overflows. And may He continue to protect us and our family. Tonight, we're going to study Exodus chapter seven. And this chapter marks the beginning of the plagues sent by God to Pharaoh. And I do a little bit of recap. The last two weeks, we studied the encounters of Moses and elders, and Moses and Pharaohs, and Moses and God. Moses was instructed by God to ask Pharaoh's permission to bring the Israelite to the wilderness for the purpose of offering sacrifice to God. But Pharaoh refused and said to Moses. Who is the Lord that I should obey Him and let Israel go? And he scolded Moses and saying that the people were lazy. And Pharaoh doubled down the Israelites' workloads. The people complained and accused Moses of putting a sword in Pharaoh's hand to kill them. So they no longer willing to listen to Moses. Again, God told Moses to speak to Pharaoh. But Moses answered God that he's not the right person for the job. He said, "I speak with faltering lips," because he thought he made a mess of things. He felt that he had offended the people and Pharaoh. Now we're going to read on to verse one of chapter seven, and there、uh, there are a few interesting points that I'm going to explain later on. Like the hardness of heart of Pharaoh, the snake and the plagues. Okay, now verse one. Then the Lord said to Moses, "See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelite go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt." He will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So, as we have just read verses one to five, God did not ask another person to take Moses' place. He again told Moses to be his representative, and Aaron in turn be Moses' messenger to confront Pharaoh on behalf of the Israelites. God told Moses to follow his precise instructions, and Aaron will be his mouthpiece. What it means is that instruction will be given by God Himself to Moses, and Moses will inform Aaron, and then Aaron will tell Pharaoh what God said. The message to Pharaoh is: release the Israelites from slavery, and let them leave Egypt. God forewarned Moses that, despite the display of miraculous signs and wonders from God, Pharaoh's heart would be hardened, indicating that Pharaoh would continue to resist the request of releasing the Israelites because. It would be a great economic loss for Egypt to allow all the slaves to leave. But God assures Moses that He will bring judgment upon Egypt and ultimately deliver the Israelites from bondage through His mighty acts, so that both the Egyptians and the Israelite will recognize Him as the true God. Now let's read verse six. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Verse seven. Moses was eighty years old, and Aaron eighty-three, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron obediently, obediently, carry out God's instruction, demonstrating that they were faithful. They were committed, even though they had some failure. And this verse also tells us that Moses was eighty, Aaron was 
83, you know, even though they're at an advanced age, they can still serve God. Now, we're going to go on. Let's read. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. Well, verse 8 is a continuation of God's instruction to Moses and Aaron following the previous verses. And God anticipated that Pharaoh would demand a miracle from Moses and Aaron to prove who they said they were. That is the representative of God, right? And so God instructed Moses that when Pharaoh asks you for proof, you demonstrate a miracle by turning your staff into a serpent. Now, at this point, I want to say something interesting about this word serpent. You know, in the book of Genesis so far, this is not the first time it talked about a serpent. In chapter 4, also it mentions serpent. Do you remember the instruction God gave to Moses initially and Aaron? He told them to tell the Israelite elders that God had heard the cries of his people and that he remember his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And that he was ready to put this promise into action and deliver the Israelite out of Egypt. And then Moses asked God, he said, what if the people don't believe me? And so Moses, I mean, and so God told Moses to perform a miracle, a sign, right? Turning his staff into a snake. You remember now? Well, about the snake. In Hebrew word, the snake in chapter 4 is N-A-K-H-A-S-H, which is just an ordinary, just a snake, right? But in this chapter, chapter 7, the snake is T-A-N-N-I-N, which means a monstrous snake. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by the secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. And Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. Moses and Aaron obediently carry out God's command, demonstrating their faithfulness and submission to God's instruction. Aaron's staff transformed into a serpent, displaying God's power. And Pharaoh responded to that miracle by calling his own wise men, sorcerers, and magicians to do the same. While well, the Egyptian believed in magic and the occult, I read that Egyptian magicians were priests of the occult, and they were guardians of a secret knowledge given by their gods to ward off blows of fate, and they used it to protect the kings. And here, the magicians were able to replicate the miracle, demonstrating a measure of their occult power. However, Aaron's snake ultimately swallows all the magician serpent's snakes, signifying Israel's God was superior than their God of their magic. However, even though Pharaoh had witnessed a miraculous sign and Aaron's staff swallowing the serpents of the magicians, his heart remained hardened, fulfilling what God said. This hardening sets the stage for the subsequent plagues and further confrontation between Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh. At this point, I would like to discuss a popular question that a lot of people ask. 
Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? In the book of Exodus, during the time of the plagues, Pharaoh expresses his hardness of heart in three different ways. Number one, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And number two, Pharaoh's heart was hardened or became hard. Number three, God hardened it. You know that the Hebrew has two different words for hardened. K-A-Z-A-Q, the first one, refers to physical or political strengthening as in making tough or uncompassionate. Second one, K-A-B-E-D, refers to being stubborn or self-fulfilled. Well, either way, these words convey Pharaoh's unwillingness to obey God's command. His will was hardened and unwilling to reason. It seems like Pharaoh himself was responsible for his hardening heart. You see, he enslaved and oppressed the people out of his own will long before the Lord began this hardening. And scholar believe the hardening of Pharaoh's heart prolonged the slavery and plague, and it provided time for God to perform miraculous signs to show both the Pharaoh and the Israelites who God is. He showed them he controls the creation. Therefore, he can use natural phenomena and supernatural ways. In doing so, God was able to distinguish between those who were under Pharaoh's protection and those who were under God's protection. So now let's read on verse 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you will say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, By this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that's in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die. And the Nile will stink, and the Egyptian will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, the canals, and the ponds, and all the pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. God repeat again about the hardening state of Pharaoh's heart, even after the miraculous signs on and warnings. The Hebrew word used here is K-A-B-E-D, can mean Pharaoh would not change much. He remains tough and self-satisfied. God instructs Moses to confront Pharaoh at the Nile River in the morning. And we'll talk in a little bit about the significance of the location. God told Moses to carry the staff with him, the staff that had transformed into a serpent not too long ago, the staff that was the symbol of God's power and authority. So Moses delivered God's message to Pharaoh once again, demanding the release of the Israelites so that they can worship God freely. The repetition underscores Pharaoh's persistent refusal to heed God's commands. God announces his intention to demonstrate his power over the Nile by turning the water into blood. This plague serves as a sign of God's authority and a warning 
of the consequences of Pharaoh's disobedience. What would be the consequence if Pharaoh doesn't obey? The consequence would include the death of fish in the Nile, and the foul odor that results from the contaminated water. And this emphasizes the severity of the judgment upon Egypt. Now let's talk a little bit about the Nile River. Why is Nile River significant? In this narrative, why is it being used in the plague? Well, Nile River was the source of Egypt's economic power. Its irrigation canals and reservoirs made Egypt the breadbasket of the Mediterranean world. By turning the Nile to blood, God symbolically demonstrated that the Lord. And not Pharaoh control Egypt's economic might. Furthermore, God also demonstrates control over the Egyptian god Osiris. Osiris is their god that controls the flow of the Nile, especially the cycle of flood. Now, verse twenty. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials, and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt, but the Egyptian magician did the same thing by their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart became hard. He would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Just as the Lord has said, instead, he turned and went into his palace, and did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along Nile to get drinking water, because they could not drink the water of the river. Moses and Aaron obedient carry out God's command, confirming their role as his representative. Aaron struck the Nile with his staff, initiating the plague as God had foretold. The devastating effect of the plague are described, with the death of the fish and the terrible smell of the water, and the widespread presence of blood, underscore the severity of this judgment. And the Egyptian magician were able to replicate. This turning of water into blood through their occult practices. So Pharaoh's heart remains hardened, then leading to further disobedience. And this highlights the ongoing spiritual battle between God's power and the forces of evil. Pharaoh, disregard the severity of the plague, just went back to his palace. Displaying his indifference and arrogance in the face of God's judgment, even though his own people were suffering, the desperate measure taken by Egyptians to find drinking water needs to, to tell us the extent of this devastation caused by the plague. And verse twenty-five. Seven days pass after the Lord struck the Nile, and that that will be another plague, and we'll do that study in chapter eight. But in summary, what have we learned in this chapter? I have three points. We learned that number one, the confrontation between Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh, it highlights themes of power, authority. And the sovereignty of God over earthly rulers, the plague also serves as both punishment for Egypt Egypt's oppression of the Israelites, and also as demonstration of God's power and ability to deliver His people. Number two, Exodus seven sets the stage for the subsequent plagues, laying out the pattern. Of warning, plague 
and Pharaoh's refusal to let the people go. Number three, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart raises question about free will, divine intervention, and the consequences of human disobedience. It also showcases God's patience and mercy in the face of human stubbornness. So I just mentioned God's patience and mercy. Seems like this chapter is all about judgment, but it also has elements that demonstrate God's mercy. Let me give you four points. Well, before each plague, God sends Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh to warn him of the impending judgment and give him the opportunity to repent and release the Israelites. And despite Pharaoh's stubbornness, these warnings demonstrate God's patience and desire for Pharaoh to turn from his wickedness. Number two, even though Pharaoh's magicians are able to replicate the miracle of turning staffs into snakes, Aaron's staff ultimately swallows theirs. This event showcases God's superiority and power and giving Pharaoh another chance to recognize God's authority and relent. Number three, despite Pharaoh's repeated refusal to heed God's warning, the fact that his heart is described as being hardened implies that he still has the capacity to repent and change his ways. God's mercy is evident in the opportunities given to Pharaoh to choose righteousness and avoid further consequences. Number four, and through the plagues, God is not only judging Egypt, but also providing a pathway for deliverance for the Israelites. Despite their years of suffering and oppression, God's grace is manifested in his plan to rescue them from bondage and lead them to the promised land. Finally, the events in Exodus chapter 7 sets the stage for the larger narrative of redemption and salvation through the book of Exodus and the entire biblical story. God's grace and mercy are the central theme as he continues to demonstrate his faithfulness to his covenant promises despite humanity's failure. Happy Sabbath. Talk to you next week. Bye.